So now that we've looked at these four different mechanisms in terms of what they need from their nucleophile or their base, um, E2 needing something that's a weak nucleophile as well as a weak base, SN1 unfortunately needing the exact same thing, and we've already talked about how it's really difficult to um, have SN1 and E1 not happening at the exact same time. E2, we need a strong base that will pull that hydrogen off, but not go after the carbon. And SN2, we need a strong nucleophile that will attack the carbon, but not go after the hydrogen. So now that we've looked at how to force each one of these four pathways, let's go back to this slide right here and kind of fill in how we can distinguish these four different types of substrates and choose which type of mechanism each one will, will undergo. So again, the starting up here with the easiest one, the methyl that has a leaving group on it, is only capable of doing SN2 just because of the restrictions of this particular molecule. If we have a primary uh, carbon with a leaving group, like a primary alkyl halide or something, and let's kind of draw again what that might look like, something like this. That molecule we've already talked about is only capable of doing either SN2 or E2. So if we have for our reactant, if we have something that is a strong nucleophile, but a weak base, we know that it will do the SN2 reaction. And how will we know if it's a strong nucleophile weak base? Well, we have a list of strong nucleophiles that are not basic. So these guys right here will do just the SN2 in this, in this particular case. Now, what if we have the opposite? If we have something that is a weak nucleophile, but a strong base. If we have a weak nucleophile but a strong base, we're going to do the E2 mechanism. And again, those substances, your weak nucleophile strong bases are right here, and that will do the E2 reaction. What if we end up with one of these guys, one of these things that is a strong nucleophile as well as a strong base? So in that case, we're going to see both mechanisms. So if we have one of those guys that is a strong nucleophile and simultaneously a strong base, we are going to simultaneously perform the E2 mechanism as well as the SN2 mechanism. So when you're predicting the products of that type of reaction, you need to predict the products for both of those mechanisms. So for example, if we had something like this, we would need to draw the SN2 product as well as draw the E2 product because both reactions will occur simultaneously. Now you might be wondering how will we know which is major, which is minor. We don't have that information. We can predict uh, among a series of E2 products, we could predict which one of those is major, but we don't have the tools to predict if the substitution will be favored over the elimination or vice versa. Okay, so let's move on and let's let's do next the tertiary alkyl halide because that's going to be a little bit easier. So what would that molecule look like? It would be something like this where our leaving group is on a tertiary carbon and this can do SN1, E1 as well as E2. So our options here, let's say that we have something that is a strong nucleophile but a weak base. If we have something that is not a good base, it's not going to be doing E1 or E2. It's going to be doing SN1. And so that's, that's our only option here. Now you might be saying, wait, strong nucleophiles actually favor the E2 reaction, and that is, or sorry, SN2 reaction, and that is true, but this molecule is not capable of doing SN2. So it can only do SN1. If you have any type of nucleophile, strong or weak, with a strong base, you are going to do E2. 
because this molecule is not capable of doing the SN2 reaction, it just won't happen. It doesn't matter if you throw a strong nucleophile at it, it's never going to be able to attack that carbon. So any type of nucleophile that is also a strong base, the first thing that's gonna happen is abstracting that hydrogen and forcing the E2 path. If you give this guy something that is a weak nucleophile with a weak base, when we have weak reagents, they favor the one pathways, SN1 and E1. If we have a weak nucleophile, then it's capable of doing SN1, so it's going to go ahead and wait for the formation of the carbocation. And if we have a weak base, it'll go ahead and do the E1 reaction, and there's no way to separate these two. So kind of like this case up here, you're going to be getting both SN1 and E1 happening at the exact same time, so you need to predict both products. Now let's look at the hardest scenario. The secondary carbon with the leaving group is always the trickiest. This is capable of doing all four different types of reactions, and we really can't push um, the four different reactions individually. We can set up conditions that will force the E2 path, and that would be if we gave this something that was a weak nucleophile, but a strong base. So if we go after this with a weak nucleophile, strong base, weak nucleophile, um, because we have a strong base, that strong base is going to be driving the reaction and strong bases drive the E2 reaction. So this is going to give us just the E2 product. Now, if we react with something that has a strong nucleophile, but is a weak base, that is going to be forcing one of the substitution pathways. And usually it's going to force the SN2 path because a strong nucleophile is associated with SN2. However, we know from learning about substitution that we can push SN1 or SN2 pathways by controlling the solvent of the reaction. So even though we normally don't think about a strong nucleophile doing the SN1 reaction, it is possible if we have an SN1 solvent. So I'm going to say here, SN1 or SN2, check the solvent. Is it polar aprotic or is it polar protic? So what if we have one of our strong strong? So we have something that is a strong nucleophile and simultaneously a strong base. These are the hardest reagents to work with because they just attack. Strong strongs will push the SN2 and the E2 pathway. They're attacking everything. They're attacking the carbon. They're attacking the hydrogens. And in that case, we get simultaneous SN2 and E2 reactions taking place. So a mixture of products from both of those types of reactions. Our last situation would be a reagent that is a weak nucleophile as well as a weak base. Now, if it's a weak nucleophile and a weak base, that means that it's really going to prefer the SN1 or E1 path. It's going to wait for the carbocation to fall off before anything happens. And we've already talked a few times about how you cannot really distinguish SN1 from E1. If it's going to take the SN1 path, it's also going to take the E1 path and vice versa. Interestingly enough, if you have a weak weak, you can also get SN2 as well as E2. Now those are not going to be happening quite as much because we're dealing with reagents that are not super reactive. But there's nothing stopping the SN2 pathway or the E2 pathway from taking place. Now do keep in mind that we will never see simultaneous SN1 or SN2. So again, we would need to check the solvent for this. But if we have a weak nucleophile, weak base, we're going to be getting the E1 as well as the E2, and then either SN1 or SN2, depending on the solvent. So this is a lot of stuff to keep in, in your mind. But if you're able to think about this in terms of what is my substrate capable of doing based on its structure, and also, what am I looking at when I'm looking at my reagent? Is this guy motivated to react or not so motivated to react?
And that can kind of help you narrow down and make some predictions about which mechanism you're, you're going to see.